Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It's a uh, it's Friday morning here in Texas, and uh, hopefully y'all are just loving on Jesus. It's a new year. Happy New Year. Thank you, Jesus. It's uh, I, I confess it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit awkward because these teachings are pre-recorded, and then they go out like this teaching will go out, you know, in like a week. A little over a week, maybe. And so it's uh, this recording day is not New Year's Day, but when it when it gets posted, it uh, it will be the new year. Like, you know, it'll be like the third of January or something around there. So, you know, when I say happy new year, I'm having to I'm having to say it in a way. You know, because again, someone who listens to this, it won't be available to listen until the new year. So hopefully that makes sense. And so that's 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 a little bit awkward, but happy new year. It's exciting. Um, uh, 2022. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, you know, we're just uh, we're just thankful, Lord, for for the work that was done and the fruit that you allowed us to bear in 2021 and and Father, we pray that 2022 would, would, would genuinely and truly be the greatest year of our lives and bearing fruit for your kingdom and growing to walk with you and know you and love you. I was, uh, I was considering what to begin the new year with. We, uh, we've gotten through eight chapters of John, verse by verse by verse, all eight chapters. I think that was around 46 teachings. I don't know. Um <clears throat> And, but so for the first few teachings, I was going to do some new year teachings. And so where better to begin than in Psalm one, Psalm one is an incredible, <clears throat> incredible Psalm. It's, uh, it's six verses. We're not told who the author is. Many postulate that it's David because David wrote around a hundred of the Psalms, <clears throat> but, um, the principles in Psalm one are relevant every moment of every day of our lives and everything we think and everything we, we, we say and in everything we do, Psalm 1 has immense relevance. So, you know, you can read along as we go through this and just uh, and exposit the psalm. That's what we do. Um, is it ex it's expository teaching. We're studying our Bible. We're meditating on the scriptures. Um, reading the scriptures is 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 of great value, but meditating on the scriptures, chewing on the scriptures is even of greater value. Um, and you know, we always remember that Romans fifteen four says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us or instruct us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Um, and so when we look into this, we don't want to look into it and just see, just read the words and just say, you know, that's cool. That's something David wrote in the Old Testament. We want to see what application it has for us to teach us or instruct us in how to live our lives in Jesus Christ, right? Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, right? For correcting, for rebuking, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God or the man or woman of God will be thoroughly equipped for everything, for every good work. So we're going to go ahead and read it, and uh, we are going to get rolling. So Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this upcoming new year. We thank you for your mercy and goodness on our lives, Lord. We thank you for just your, your wonderful blessings that you've given us um, in every manner and every way. Lord Jesus, we pray that 2022 would truly be the greatest year of our lives in walking with you, in loving you, in growing to know you, in, uh, in growing to bear fruit for you, Lord Jesus. I pray it would be a year of just increasing intimacy and relationship with you, a year of increasing holiness, and Lord, again, a, a year of increasing fruitfulness. 
Father, we love you and we bless you. We thank you for your mercy and goodness on our lives, Father. Above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and God and King. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, Psalm 1. I'm going to try to get through the six verses. I think uh, I think we should be able to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and read it, and we will get rolling. Happy New Year. <clears throat> All right, Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Verse 4, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So right off the bat, the entire psalm is a balance, and we see this in verse 6, is a balance between the life of the righteous and what the psalmist calls the, the, the life of the wicked. Verse 6, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. This is the conclusion that this psalm writer gives, but the way of the wicked will perish. When we study the first three verses, <clears throat> you can see what the, the psalmist describes as the way of what a righteous man or woman lives their life. And in verses four, five, and six, you can see the results of what happens for those who are not righteous and what the Bible calls wicked. Um, and how they live their life and the outcome of that. And, and first off, you'll notice there's no middle ground. There's no righteous and then like 15 other things, Corinne, and then wicked. Because the vast majority of us, Scott, we like to live in that kind of middle ground. We like to live in that gray area. And the Bible is, is in no way really in any way, gray. It very much is black and white, right? True and false. The righteous and the wicked. The sheep and the goats. The saved and the unsaved. The going to heaven and going to hell. Right? You're, you're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. You're either forgiven of your sins or you're not. The reason this is important, the reason this is is, 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 is so massively important is again, because most of us wittingly and, and even probably more often than not unwittingly, we like to live in this gray area. Okay. We want this gray area of life. I'm guilty of it too. Purgatory was invented by people who want a gray area. Okay. Um, in the 66 books of the Bible, there is no, no purgatory, okay? There's heaven, and then there's hell. Those in heaven are the ones who have genuinely trusted and relied on Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and the salvation of their soul as their only Lord and Savior. They're clinging to Jesus Christ. They recognize their sinfulness. They agree with what the scriptures say, that all human beings are sinful. Romans 3.23 says that all of us have sinned. Every human being ever, except Jesus, the God-man, have sinned and fall short of God's holy standard. And because of that, we are separated from the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three separate beings. In Jesus Christ, we have the incredible privilege of having relationship 
intimate relationship with each of them individually. A Christian, someone who's genuinely saved and forgiven of their sin and going to heaven when they die, is someone who acknowledges their sinfulness. They've humbled themselves before Jesus, acknowledging their sinfulness, and because of their sinfulness, their hopelessness, their helplessness, and their utter desperation. They understand that there is no hope for them except running to the cross of Jesus Christ and placing their full faith and confidence completely and totally in what Jesus did for them at the cross on their behalf and in their place. At the cross, the Bible teaches that Jesus died in our place and he was punished in our place. Peter even tells us that Jesus went to hell, right? Now, Jesus did not go to hell and suffer in hell. He did not go to hell and was tormented in hell. He went to hell and conquered hell, right? When Jesus stepped into the gates of hell, fear came over every being in hell like never there was, okay? So <clears throat> there's this idea <clears throat> and this theology that, you know, that Jesus had to suffer in hell in our place, okay? Now, like I said, the scripture does say that Jesus went into hell, but nowhere does it say that he suffered in hell, okay? All the suffering of Christ and the sin of the world was paid for when he was nailed at the cross. The suffering for the sin of the world, the, uh, the payment for the debt of the sin of all human beings was paid for on the cross. So, Again, Jesus dies in our place and he's, he, he suffers in our place, right? He takes our place. We should have died the death Jesus did. We should have suffered as Jesus did. But a true Christian is someone, again, who humbled themselves before Jesus, acknowledged their sinfulness. They know that they're hopeless and desperate and helpless without Jesus and then in that place, Romans 10, 13 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's important to understand it's not words that save us. It's Christ that saves us. But we use our words to communicate our heart to him. And, and in that place, we call out to Jesus. And we humbly call out to him and acknowledge to him. And we pray to him and say, you know, Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinful person. And I know, Lord, that I cannot save myself. I know there's nothing I can do that will save me. I'm hopeless, Jesus. But Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe that you did come and lived a perfect life for me and died that torturous, horrible death on the cross for me. And Lord Jesus, I believe that you are alive and risen today. Therefore, Lord Jesus, I ask you now to come into my heart and to be the Lord of my life and to save me from my sin and to bring me to heaven when I die. Lord Jesus, I place all of my faith and hope and trust and confidence in you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God. That's a Christian, okay? That's someone who's saved. Now, in that place, you are made righteous before God. So when the psalmist says, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, the only way for us to be righteous today, okay, is number one, we have to have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior in the way I just explained very clearly. And when you do that, when you call on Jesus and ask him to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life, at that moment, the Spirit of Jesus or the Holy Spirit actually does come and live inside of you and joins himself to you, okay? You become one with him, right? And at that moment, you become spiritually alive. You receive eternal life. 
you go from spiritual death, you are actually dead to God in spirit. You were alive physically, but your spirit was dead to God. And eternal life enters into you and you are regenerated. You are born again by the Holy Spirit. When he joins himself to your spirit, you become one with the Holy Spirit or the spirit of Jesus. And, and a spiritual life explodes into you. And you are alive spiritually. The Bible says in in uh, 1 John that, that God is spirit, right? Uh, in the Gospel of John, right? I think it's chapter 4. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Um, chapter 5. Um, four. Yeah, four. Um, and I talked through those eight chapters. I'm sorry. Um, and so because God is spirit, we too have to be spiritually alive beings. When we enter this world, we are spirit beings, but our spirit is dead to God because of the sinful nature we received from our parents and their parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve and their original sin. In Jesus Christ, we become spiritually alive. And in that place, right, we are now children of God. God is spirit, and we too are living spirits, right? We're also still alive physically, but our spirit is alive through Jesus Christ. And we are his children. God the Father is our heavenly father. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and Master and King. He's our husband. Remember I said the Holy Spirit becomes one with us. We are one with the Holy Spirit spiritually. We are connected. We are one. Like when a, a husband and wife come together in intimacy and in marriage, they are one physically in physical intimacy. We are one with Jesus in spiritual intimacy. It's incredible, right? It's wonderful. It's, 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 it's the greatest thing, right? And so we're one with Jesus in spirit. And at that moment in, in salvation, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, this incredible exchange happens. The perfect righteous life that Jesus lived is credited to us as if we lived it. And all of our sin and disobedience that we ever committed in our life, past, present, and future sin, is credited to Jesus at the cross. And that exchange is the heart of the Christian gospel. The exchange of my horrible sin, again, my past sin, my present sin, and my future sin is all credited to Jesus and the perfect righteous life he lived is credited to me as if I lived it. There's no words for how incredible that is. And we certainly won't get through Psalm 1 today, I'm sorry. Um, the importance of all this, okay, as believers in Jesus Christ, it is important that you know and understand these things, okay? I often say them and teach on them over and over, but very, 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 very few Christians, maybe one in 5,000 Christians, Maybe one in 10,000, maybe one in 100,000 truly understand these things. And so it's important that we understand them. And the reason I'm going into it so deeply is the entire psalm is really about verse 6, where it says, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So we need to understand what the righteous are. That righteousness, that perfect righteous life that Jesus received and that's credited to you, that's called imputed righteousness. It's when the individual puts their faith in Jesus Christ in their life, genuinely, as, we, as I showed you how, how you do that earlier, at that moment, that perfect righteous life is imputed to you. It's credited to you. And that's called imputed righteousness. And as I said, all of your sin is credited to Jesus at the cross. And that incredible exchange is the heart of the Christian gospel. Now, the Bible teaches there are three kinds of righteousness. This imputed righteousness is, is, is the first kind. Again, that's the righteousness, the righteous life that Jesus Christ lived 
is credited to you upon your receiving him as Savior in exchange of all your sin and disobedience credited to him at the cross. The second righteousness is a self-righteousness. The Bible teaches what's called a self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is when an individual is not trying to be made right with God by trusting in Jesus Christ, knowing he's their only hope. Someone who's self-righteous is trying to be made right with God and go to heaven in themselves, by their own life, by their own good deeds, by their own good works. They believe that in themselves, self-righteousness, they can be made right with God. They believe somehow they can offset their sin. Generally, every human being will recognize they've done wrong things, had wrong thoughts, said wrong things. Of course, right? We all do it. We do it almost daily, actually daily. Um, but there's this scale mentality in their mind. They're going to do a lot of really good stuff, and hopefully God is going to put their good on the one side of the scale and their bad on the other, and they hope their good outweighs their bad, and in themselves, they will have offset their sin and go to heaven. It will never work. It's completely and totally unbiblical. It's not true. Not in any way does our good take away our bad, and it certainly doesn't in this life. In the state of Texas, if we murder someone, all the good we do, will not take that away. We would stand before a judge and a judge would either give us life in prison or we'd be executed, right? Because good doesn't take away bad, right? I can't blow through a red light, right, Leah? And 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 get pulled over by the policeman and say, what are you talking about, officer? I didn't run the last 200. I stopped at all those. Man, the policeman would probably say, well, well done, John. Because of all that good you did, and not running those and stopping at those, I'm not going to give you a ticket. Er, doesn't work, right? It's crazy, right? All the good I did in stopping at that 200 red lights, all the good I did at obeying the law would not take away this violation and I'd have to pay my debt to society and pay that ticket. In the same way, all the good we do will not take away our sin. We need a savior. We're hopeless, we're helpless, because good doesn't take away bad. We need a savior because we're sinful, right? Remember Matthew 1, right? When the angel tells to Joseph, right? I think it's verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We need a savior to save us from our sins because nothing we do can offset or take away our sins. All we can do is just humbly throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and trust and rely on him as our only Lord and Savior, again, as I outlined earlier. So, second kind of righteousness is self-righteousness, right? When you're trying to be made right with God through your own efforts. But the third kind of righteousness, and that's the righteousness that the psalmist is speaking about here, is called lifestyle righteousness. And that's how you live your life, moment by moment, day by day, Scott, in a, in a right way before the Lord. Right, Lauren? What, what is lifestyle righteousness, Lauren? My daughter Lauren always says, it's someone who takes the time to think about what's right so that they can do what's right simply because it's right. And they do this as a lifestyle, right? They consistently do this in every aspect of their lives. They just want to do what's right. Now, let me, let me make something clear here. Most of us, myself included at times, have been deceived. And we just assume we do this. We don't, okay? We don't just naturally do it, okay? It's something we have to labor at. We have to really work throughout each day of our lives to actually think in any given situation what's right and what's not. And really, it's from the time we have interaction and thoughts in, in any way. Okay, I'll wake up and, there, and you know, let's just say I have a, a train of thought that'll come into my mind. 
that I'll be frustrated still when I woke up, the thought will come into my mind and I may just be irritated by someone's lack of cooperation or just something didn't go the way I wanted to. And I'll start thinking about it pretty soon within like a minute, right? Or even five seconds. I'm irritated again about the situation, right? Maybe this doesn't happen to none of y'all and just me. And that's not right, okay? I needed to have already forgiven that person, moved on, not considered it. And most of the time, of course, this is what I do. But I need to stop and think. Because I can just, we can just go on and let that thought process keep rolling. Keep being irritated. Keep being frustrated. Keep being off put, Esther, right? But I have to stop and think, you know what? This is not right. I'm not going to think about it. Lord Jesus, I pray your blessing and, and mercy and goodness over that person. I ask you to bless my brother, Jesse. <laughs> I just, Lord, I just thank you for your mercy and goodness on our lives. So it doesn't just come. It just doesn't happen. Again, the vast majority of, of the world thinks they're fairly good people and they just do what's right. Someone who has a lifestyle of righteousness, the third kind of righteousness, is someone who consistently throughout their day is actually taking the time to think about what's right. And, they, and they're doing it because they have a heart because they want to say and do what's right. Again, for no other reason but because it's right. And that's the third kind of righteousness, which is lifestyle righteousness. Now, you cannot have any lifestyle righteousness until you first have imputed righteousness. Because remember, an imputed righteousness is 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 that when Jesus Christ comes to live in you by his Holy Spirit, the perfect righteous life that Jesus lived is credited to you and your sin and disobedient life, past, present, and future, is credited to Jesus, right? And now with Jesus Christ living in you and giving you spiritual life, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is the only one that can empower you to live in lifestyle righteousness. Without Jesus living in you, you cannot have any true and genuine lifestyle righteousness. You can do good things by the common grace of God, okay? But you cannot live in a righteous way before God until God lives in you and is one with you in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's incredible, right, Allegan? It's just, it's remarkable. So, all of that is to pave the way for this incredible psalm, right? Because the psalm, again, is, is looking at the different outcomes and attitudes and ways of those who walk in lifestyle righteousness, right? Because they have the righteousness of Christ, and those who don't, and remember, those who don't have the righteousness of Christ are not called pretty good. They're not called okay. They're not called, they kind of need to do better, Jose. They're not called, you know, well, they're getting there. They're called wicked, okay? If we're not in Jesus Christ today, if we haven't received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there are now no question countless levels of wickedness, right? But if we're not in Jesus Christ today, the Bible refers to us as the wicked. And I, listen, I know that's harsh. I know it's, golly, it's heavy. But there's only two types of people here, okay? And we see this again throughout the scriptures. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to try to get through verse one here because this is exciting. It's a new year, but we need that foundation. Again, that theological foundation that was just laid for you there is important. And you ought to get to where it's it's just uh, locked down in you, uh, David. You ought to get y'all to where you can actually articulate it at some level yourselves, right? To where you really understand it and are fluent in it, you know, in a manner, Anthony, that, man, this just really makes sense. Whew. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. It's the new year, and there is nothing in our lives that's going to bless us this year 
more than spending time in the Word of God. Spending time reading, studying, meditating, thinking about, chewing on, feeding on the Word of God. Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We don't just live on physical food. We live on spiritual food, Stephen. And as the new year begins, Psalm 1 verse 1 says this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Verse two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, in the word of God. His delight is in his Bible. Her delight is in her Bible. And on it, and on his law, he meditates day and night. <laughs> wow. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord means the entire word of God, the entire Bible. His or her delight is in these scriptures because they know they're the living word of God. They know they're so valuable, so incredible, so overwhelming. There's just nothing more valuable than spending time reading, studying, meditating on the scriptures. And of course, above all, then obeying the scriptures that you've meditated on, right? Believing the scriptures. Blessed is the man. And when it says man here, it means humanity, means man and woman. Blessed is the man and woman. Don't you want that blessing? Here's the first blessing of the book of Psalms, right? Longest book in the Bible, 150 chapters. A lot of chapters, right? Um, in the first line is, blessed is the man and woman, the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. There's a blessing that comes when you do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, again, this is a very interesting statement because oftentimes, even as Christians, we can have ungodly counsel, right? Actually, the other version actually says, blessed is the, the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Um, even as Christians... The, the, the vast majority of the church, the entire church, really, we, we often even consistently have and give ungodly counsel, even though we're Christians. And the reason is, is because we're immature. We're, we're baby Christians in so many ways that we often don't give biblical counsel. And, um, and it's something we need to repent over. When we give counsel, when we give advice, right, or when we're just in conversation, right, we, of course, can have fun and we want to have fun and we want to cut up. I like to a lot, right? And it's fine to, to, to have humor, right? But in our day-to-day -day conversations, our serious conversations, and our day-to-day -day counsel or advice, it needs to be based on the word of God and the heart of God through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We ought not ever give counsel that's contrary to the Bible. Now, regrettably, the vast majority of Christians today know little about the Bible, and that's why we do these things, right? That's why we do these teachings, right? That's why we go to a good Bible-based church, right? Um, to listen to good, sound teaching. But we do need to get to a place where we are daily spending time in our word, meditating on the scriptures ourselves, being fed in the scriptures ourselves, you know, getting the meat of the scriptures and the, the juice from the scriptures and the, the nourishment from the scriptures ourselves, right? I don't even know nothing about it all, how it all works, but there's something about when you say chew a piece of, um, of beef or, or a vegetable or whatever, and you chew it and you get the nourishment out of it as you're chewing it and the juices just flow into your body, right? But if we were to just chew it all up 
and then take that chewed piece and give it to someone else to eat, they would still get, you know, that food in their body. But wouldn't they lose a whole lot, Dustin? Because they didn't chew it themselves. They didn't they didn't get, you know, the, that, that experience of chewing it and getting those juices is the same with the word of God. It's good for you to listen to good Bible-based teachings. It's good for you to listen to what I'm teaching here. That's good. We ought to do it. But, but it's even more important you get in your Bible yourself and spend time meditating, studying, and reading these scriptures, right? There, there's, there's nothing in our lives that's going to be of greater benefit to us than that. Right. As you see, verse two says that that his delight is in the law of the Lord. Oftentimes, regrettably, yes, even as Christians, our delight is giving ungodly counsel or wicked counsel. Our delight is in gossip. Our delight is in uh, just complaining about everything. Right. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. What is your delight in? Is your delight in the Bible? <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> it's funny. Because no, it's not really funny. But our delight is genuinely, right, in almost everything else except the scriptures, right? Our delight is in that, uh, our delight is in that Instagram, <laughs> right? I mean, our delight is in that Facebook, right? Our delight is in that Snapchat. Our delight is in that tactic, right? That's what we delight in, right? We delight in watching that Netflix and that show, right? You know, and, uh, and it's wrong, Lord. And I ask you to forgive us. It's just, uh, you know, the reason I'm amused is because this guy right here, right? This man is delighting in the word of God. And he's meditating on it and thinking about it and in his Bible and studying his Bible day and night. And even when I look at my own life and I teach this, this is my job. You know, I don't delight enough in the scriptures. And I'm sorry, Father. Father, I do want to delight more. So much more in your scriptures. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Can you see this here? This is... My brother Jesse gave me this and I was going through the Proverbs and I was, I was highlighting these scriptures and I was trying to meditate on them and think about them. If you're just listening on the podcast, I was showing highlights in, in this Bible I have. So this is going to be part one, obviously, and we're going to finish up here. But blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. For the first blessing comes when we're not partnering or walking and and sharing ungodly counsel right and as i said this is this is uh this is an immense issue in the church and of course it's one that's just completely overwhelmed in in non-christians right um that we we they consistently give counsel now listen a non-christian can give good and wise counsel regrettably often there are some non-christians that give far better counsel than most christians um, but again, it's only in Jesus Christ and, 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 and receiving him as your Lord and Savior. John 1, 12, right? To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's only in Jesus Christ that we can truly give sound biblical counsel, okay? And, 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 and counsel with, with, with the authority of the scriptures in them. OK, now I'll say again, someone without Jesus Christ can give right counsel. And, and oftentimes that certainly does happen. Right. But it's only in Jesus Christ that the meaning and the power and the substance and the fruit can really come. Right. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Look what it says here. You see a progression. OK. And by the way, that counsel of the wicked certainly can come out of our own minds as well. Right. Again, as I've said, I have to check myself um, so that I am consistently, you know, in my conversation and in my uh, my exhortation and in my counsel, um, making sure it is based on the word of God and the heart of God through in and through Jesus Christ, the son of God. 
Um, and I want to say again, this is not some big religious experience. That's not what this is about. This is actually the most genuine freedom we can have in Jesus Christ if we'll learn to live our lives this way. So you see the progression. Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the word of God and the law of the Lord and on it he meditates day and night. We start by walking in sin, right? We may There may be some sin in me. There may be something that we shouldn't be looking at and maybe we just kind of walk by it, but we keep walking. We don't stop yet. And we just kind of check it out and it has our interest, right? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. But then look what happens. Or stand in the way of sinners. Now you're not walking anymore. Now instead of just walking by, you stopped and you're standing in it, right? Now you're, 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 you're actually there and you're actually taking it in. And look at the last one. Or sit in the seat of mockers. Now you've just sat down in it. Now you're comfortable in it. So there, there's clearly a progression of sin in this verse as well, right? And there's a blessing for the man. This is what the Bible calls someone who has a lifestyle of righteousness. Doesn't do these things, okay? They're not perfect, okay? We won't be perfect this side of heaven, but they have a consistent lifestyle throughout their day of not doing these things. So we'll end this by saying is, do you have a lifestyle of not walking in the counsel of the wicked? Do you have a lifestyle where you don't engage in ungodly conversation and gossip, where you don't give ungodly counsel, you don't encourage people to stay mad at others, you, uh, you know, do you have a lifestyle of encouraging people to love and forgive and looking for reconciliation? Is that your lifestyle? Or do you have a lifestyle of wanting to stay angry and stay bitter and, and talk to anyone who will listen about it? And then justify your, your talking about it through, you know, whatever justification we give. Oh, can you pray for him? And then we expose the person and what they did or how they did wrong or how they mistreated us or whatever, right? Forgive us, Father. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Father, we ask you to help us this year that this would be a year where we would delight more and more in the scriptures. We would delight more and more in the living word of God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you help us. Help us one and all, Holy Spirit to delight in your scriptures, to spend time in your word, to spend time reading and meditating on your word. And again, above all, obeying your word and, and quickly repenting when we fall short. I ask you to help us that our delight would be less and less in the things of this world and more and more in, in the holy scriptures. And I pray that we would open that Bible even day and night. Father, we love you and we bless you and we thank you. We thank you for this new year. Holy Spirit, we ask you to go ahead of us, to lead us, to guide us, to convict us in the scriptures and the living word of God. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. Help us above all to see Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and God and King. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. We thank you for all you've done and continue to do for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen.